Hey YouTube, my name is Alex Conconi. I'm the founder of Conconi Growth Partners, a private investment company based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And not long ago, I had the unique pleasure of hosting a call with Peter Zion, author of the New York Times bestselling book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization. And over the last year, my team and I have been using Peter's content as a way to challenge our thinking and broaden our perspective. And uh, the goal of this call was to get his thoughts as it relates to Canada in particular. And we talked a lot about Canada, but we also talked about a whole bunch of other stuff, from China to Russia to inflation to chat GPT. Um, it was a really interesting conversation, and I'm excited to share it with you on YouTube here so that you can, um, you can hear it for yourself as well. We're going to talk about a lot of Canada here. Whether or not you're going to like what I have to say is an open question. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. There's a lot of ground to cover, and I want to make sure we have enough time for interaction because I know there's going to be a boatload of questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in here. So this first slide is the net worth of Americans by age bracket, specifically by tenure chunk. <laughs> now, as you get older, you get raises, you get better at your job, maybe you start a business or buy a farm, and you become wealthier. It tends to increase with your age, but the, the real magic happens when you turn 50 because that's when your single biggest expense, your last child, leaves home and becomes someone else's problem. And the money that you save from that move, you tend to put towards your single largest or your second largest expense, which is typically your home. And on average, by age 55, you have paid it down to zero. And so that last decade from 55 to 64, that is the richest you will be in your life. And that is the most active your capital will be in your life because you're finally really thinking about retirement and you know you have to save every dime you can. Now that drives more than just your retirement. That 10 year period, that decade of wealth accumulation is 70% of global private capital. That is the velocity of money. That is literally where the money is. And that's what drives everything. Now, when you turn 65, you tend to retire. And that means you have to liquidate most of your holdings. Because if you're holding a stock heavy portfolio and there's a currency crisis or a market crash, you lose everything and you no longer have the income to rebuild your position. So in the case of the United States, you go primarily from stocks and bonds into T-bills and cash. Government debt tends to figure predominantly. They tend to be very liquid and very non-volatile investments. Normally this hasn't really mattered, but things are changing now because we've had this big shift in the post-World War II environment. It used to be if you had iron ore and coal and um, food and oil, you could industrialize and make something of yourself. But that doesn't hold anymore. The world has changed. We've globalized. And when in a global system, you don't have to have all four of those. You only need one because you can trade for the other three. So the Americans created a different sort of investment environment accidentally. And that's changed how we live. Because now not only do you have the opportunity to expand economically, but when you move off the farm and into the city, take industrial jobs, your personal life changes. When you're on the farm, you have a bottomless supply of kids because you need to labor. But when you live in town, kids are just expenses. So you have fewer of them. And so we're dealing with two simultaneous evolutions right now in the 2020s. First of all, the Americans have changed their mind about supporting the global system and globalization. We have had to pay a lot on our side of the border in order to maintain an open world. We've had to keep our markets open. We've had to patrol the global oceans for everyone. That is not free and the opportunity costs are huge. And so in election after election after election, Americans have chosen the more isolationist and the more economically nationalist candidate that goes right up to Joe Biden. You remove the Americans from the equation. You let the chips fall where they may and you're going to have a series of powers around the world that either out of desperation or opportunity are going to try to take matters into their own hands. And that's going to generate conflicts specifically in these zones. Now, one of those we know very well is the Ukraine war. But never forget that the Ukraine war is an outcome, a symptom of deglobalization. It is not the cause. And we should expect to see more conflicts in the future as the Americans take less of a hands-on approach and economic norms change.
And so when you break down the economic norms of globalization, these are the zones that can reach out and touch someone and try to do something about their situation. So we're going to have, obviously, the, the Russian space is in the Ukraine war right now. This is not the end of that. I expect to see a broad brawl between the Saudis and the Iranians. And there's going to be a battle over the Chinese space as the Chinese system fails and tries to adapt to whatever's next. Okay, that's a that's a big comment, the Chinese system failing. I, I think I'm sure you're going to get into that, but I'd I love to hear more come, about that. Yeah. <laughs> now, remember that transition from farm to city. This is new, historically speaking. It used to be that we have a demographic structure that looks a lot like Nigeria today. And so it doesn't matter if people who are 65 retire because there's more people below them. And the proportion of old versus young has stayed more or less static since the dawn of recorded history. But with the Americans changing the world with globalization, we went a different direction. We moved into the cities. We had fewer kids. And 75 years on, this is the American demographic now. Suddenly it matters if everyone who's 65 retires, because now it's not a small sliver, it's the largest generation in American history. And on average, the American baby boomers retired in the fourth quarter of calendar year 2022. So we've always known in the United States that between January of 2021 and December of 2023, the cost of capital in the United States was going to go up by a factor of five simply because of demographics. Everything that the Federal Reserve does is on top of that. Anything that we do to fight inflation is on top of that. And we're only about halfway through that process right now. Now, within this one picture, there's any number of stories to tell. So in the case of the United States, we're obviously losing the boomers to retirement. That is the largest generation we've ever had, the largest workforce we've ever had. And we're replacing them with the Zoomers, which are the smallest generation we've ever had. In calendar year 2022, that was a shortage of 400,000 workers. And we know that that number is going to increase each and every year for the next 12, at least until we hit a shortage of 900,000. So we're kind of locked into this labor shortage period for at least the next decade. Probably better to think of it as two, because that's just the bottom. We start crawling out of it. And we won't be back to a 2019 labor structure in the United States until the millennials' kids come of age. That's the mid-2040s. So all we have to do in the United States is wait 20 years. Now, there's lessons from this for everything, especially when it comes to real estate. The boomers are downsizing. The millennials are finally moving into the suburbs and raising their families. It's changing the balance of supply and demand across the entire market. Now, Gen X, that's my generation, looks at the baby boomers and we feel a healthy volume of disgust. We really don't like the way they have led their lives or led the country or formed their families. When the boomers entered the workforce in the late 60s to the early 80s, there were so many of them, largest generation ever, so many of them that they pushed down the cost of labor. And that meant that boomers competed with one another for price of labor, which meant that they were working below maybe what their skill set would justify. And it also meant that they were the most mobile generation America had ever had because they felt they had to go to wherever the jobs happened to be. And once they got there, they discovered that that still wasn't enough. And a lot of boomer families decided that the second parent had to enter the workforce as well. That generated a lot of pressure on the family unit and is the single biggest reason why the boomer generation has the highest divorce rate in American history. And Gen X looks at that like, you know, we're not, we're not going to make that mistake. We're going to make different mistakes. For us, our time is at least as important as our money. And we are far more likely to be single income households. Now, to this point, that has really worked against us because we've been the low people on the totem pole and there have been so many boomers that we have seen the lowest raises, the lowest increases in take home pay annually of any generation in American history. But we have more durable family units and marriages as a result. It's been bad until about two years ago, because two years ago, it became clear that the most of the baby boomers were about to retire and the labor market started to shift. And all of a sudden, Gen X is in high demand. And even if we all wanted to work and we do not, there would never have been enough of us to fill all those shoes in the first place. So we're now seeing raises 
on par with the greatest increases in take home pay in American history. And it's got another 10 years to run. Now, that so, is, go ahead. I think COVID obviously has clouded a lot of a lot of this for everybody. And I think a lot of people are attributing a lot of the change and disruption to COVID, which undoubtedly it, it has to have played a role. But do you think if there wasn't if COVID didn't happen, would we still be seeing a lot of this today and having these same conversations? I'd argue that we're seeing the pressure in the housing market because Gen X has more money now than they've ever had before. And a lot of the push we've seen, particularly in the last 12 months since COVID led up in the United States, a lot of the pressure that we have seen in the labor for, or the, excuse me, in the, in the real estate markets is Gen X finally having their moment. And this moment has several years to run. It will run until Gen X starts to retire. And that is not for another 12 to 15 years. So you should expect a small number of relatively well-capitalized buyers dominating the top end of the markets in residential. You got to consider what Gen X's approach to life is going to mean for the office, because the only thing that Gen X hates more than going to the office is the commute to get to the office. Remember, this is a generation that defines itself as valuing their time more than their money. And now Gen X are the managers and they're taking over all the top positions throughout the world and they don't want to go in. So you should expect significant changes in corporate policy that is going to damage an entire real estate asset class for at least the next decade. That's, uh, that's super interesting. And as a millennial, I think I'd argue that, that that valuing of time isn't just a Gen X thing. It's a millennial thing and, and probably a, a Zoomer thing as well. So well, Yes and no. I mean, it, it, this is one of those things that we won't know until we know. And, you know, the millennials are still relatively young and the Zoomers are only now entering the market. But the initial stuff that I have seen suggests that like, all those reports that we heard about how young people were be, being really damaged by the isolation of COVID, that holds true for the millennials. The millennials are eager to get back into groups, and that includes being around the office cooler. The Zoomers are different. The Zoomers are loners. They prefer to work solo. They don't like to interact with a lot of people directly. They're very loyal workers, but they never want to actually meet you. So mm -hmm. I think the model moving forward will probably be a team of millennials, mostly in the office, not exclusively, who are doing the collaborative, cooperative managerial leadership work. And then a satellite of Zoomers who work remote, who feed in the information that's necessary with the Xers and their families, probably in the Bahamas for the quarter because they don't want to be there at all. And they figured out they can do it all remotely. Some flavor of that is probably what we're looking at. Very interesting. So the American demographic situation is changing and based on who you are, that's either very good or very bad but it's nothing compared to the Titanic shifts we're seeing everyone else, everywhere else. Now, these blue arrows are pointing at America's millennials. They are providing consumption now to support the American economic system. And in a few years, they will be providing the investment as they get into their 50s. And their children will also be a large generation. They're just now being born. And that will round up the labor market 20 years from now. So in the United States, you only have to wait 10 years for a better capital environment, and you only have to wait 20 years for a better labor environment. But holy crap, look at everybody else. I mean, the German system, it was terminal 40 years ago. They're not running out of children. That happened 20 years ago. They're now running out of working aged adults. And we are going to see some degree of industrial collapse in the German space by the end of the decade, assuming nothing else wrecks it before then. And some of the outcomes of the Ukraine war may well do that in the next two years. And then there's China. China's workforce is already the world's fastest aging. And we now know that this data is wrong. The Chinese about a year ago started admitting publicly that they've overcounted their population by at least 100 million people with all of the missing millions people who would have been born since the one child policy was adopted 40 years ago meaning that they're all under 40. That suggests that these yellow bars don't even exist. We don't have an economic theory for what would work with this demographic in 2030. We are in the final 
decade of the Chinese country. And there's all kinds of things that have to do with energy or food or fertilizer or manufacturing or trade or war that could end this sooner. But China's use by date is just eight years away at this point. Well, I said there, there might be some controversial opinions that you have, and that's that's one of the more interesting ones. I think there's a lot of things that people take for granted. They take for granted globalization, they take for granted low interest rates, they take for granted low inflation. And I think a lot of people have taken for granted China's rise and the idea that it's going to take over and eclipse the United States. And it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, well, the, the Chinese government itself, the CCP's propaganda arm, is no longer talking about overtaking the United States economically. That should tell you everything you need to know, because the propaganda always overshoots, and now they're starting to dial it back really, really significantly. Yeah, one, I mean, one of the points I've heard you make in the past is how nobody's benefited more than China from the U.S.-led international order and, and the U.S. policing of trade routes, that sort of thing, making it possible for everybody to trade with everybody. And it's always seemed strange to me, if that's true, that China has kind of fought that idea. I, I mean, perhaps there's been some signaling that that's changing. Well, as, as Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics are local. And the way the Chinese system consolidated it in the post-Maoist era is you had a guy by the name of Deng Xiaoping or Deng Xiaoping, excuse me, who picked who would rule China for the next 20 years, two guys, Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao. But he knew that he wasn't smart enough to see past 20 years. So he told those two factions that they then had to come up with a compromise candidate to secede them. And that person is Hu Jin, I'm sorry, that person is, wow, Xi Jinping, the, the current chairman. Xi spent the first years of his term doing a purge of anyone in the country who was a potential political opponent, and then spent the next five years of his term purging everyone from the system who was capable of independent thought to make sure there would never be a challenge at all. And now he sits atop the heap, but there's no one in the country who is intellectually capable of helping him, and no one in the bureaucracy wants to bring him news that might elicit an opinion, because they don't know what's going to piss him off. So we're seeing a government breakdown from the inside at the very, very top, because all policy starts and stops with one person. And even if he was the smartest person in human history, he couldn't manage a system this large. But at the same time, you've got this dependence upon the United States for all things energy and food and manufacturing. So the solution for the last few years has been blatant, nationalistic, narcissistic, lambasting propaganda in order to make sure that the population is fully on board with him. That works until it doesn't. And one of the things that we've seen in just the last few days is Xi has reassigned a guy by the name of Zhao Lili. Liening, who used to be the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he's the guy who popularized the term wolf warrior diplomacy, which is basically you throw everything in everyone's face all the time, blame everyone for everything, make up stuff on the cuff if it sounds good to make someone look bad. And he has been the forefront for the anti-American propaganda throughout the Chinese system for the last three years. Well, now he's been assigned to basically border patrol. It's difficult to come up with a more blatant downsizing of somebody's authority. So it is possible, possible that Xi has realized just how deep the doo-doo is and is starting to dig out, but I'd argue that it's too late. One of the few things that the American political spectrum agrees on is that China needs to be taken down a few notches. And so we're seeing a steady crunching of American policy down on China, specifically with tech in the last couple of months, but we're going to see it with energy going in the next couple of months because of some of the shifts that are happening in the Ukraine war. R remember that we now have a price cap and no insurance for any Russian exports. That means that stuff is going to fall off the market pretty soon because the, no one can insure the ships to make sure that they leave. That's probably going to cost the Chinese two to three million barrels a day of Russian crude. That is more than enough to cause an energy-induced depression that lasts several years, even assuming the United States stops with its onslaught on everything else. So mm -hmm. they're going to have to do a lot more than change the mouthpiece if they want to make the United States friendly again. The head of the U.S. Navy recently warned that the U.S. military must be prepared for the possibility of a Chinese invasion in Taiwan before 2024. That's coming up pretty quick. First question. How likely do you think a war in Taiwan is to be? 
it's the U.S. military's job to be prepared for contingencies, so you know, no, no criticism there, but I don't think there's going to be a war. Every assumption that the Chinese have made about war because of the Ukraine war has been, I'm sorry, every assumption that the Ukrainian, let me try the sentence again. Every assumption <laughs> that Beijing has made about how war happens has been proven wrong by the Ukraine war, and they now need a completely new plan. It's possible that Xi has been so isolated for so long that he's forgotten a, a little bit about the basic position of China in international affairs, but I don't think so. And I think he knows that if there is a war, that is the end of China as a country, as an industrialized entity, it would be national suicide. So I, I personally find that very unlikely. The only reason that what? I can think of that the Chinese would do it anyway is if you know in your heart in China that the end is near anyway, demographic collapse, energy crisis, food crisis, trade crisis, then maybe there's something to be said for pulling the trigger because at least then you get to write the narrative of what's next. And if you can do that and keep the CCP in power for the low, low cost of 500 million dead Chinese, then maybe it's worth considering. The smart way to fight Taiwan or China is not within its own coastal waters. It does have a large Navy. They don't have much range, but there's a bunch of ships. The smart thing would be to put two destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin and cut the energy flows. China imports 80% of its energy. 75% of that comes from just the Persian Gulf. And most of the rest comes from Africa. So it's on the same route through the Indian Ocean. So two ships would be enough to, to send it to zero. And the Chinese war machine would stop within days and the Chinese economy would stop within weeks and the Chinese population would be starving within months. It'd be very, very easy. And Xi knew this three years ago. Uh, whether or not he still remembers it now that it, there's no one reminding him of it is an open question. We just don't know. But if there was a war, China would fall very, very, very quickly. That doesn't mean that they couldn't inflict damage. That's not what I'm saying. All of Japan and Korea and Taiwan are within range of their air force and their missiles. It would hurt. But destroying China completely as a modern system would be child's play. As for what the Americans would feel, there's really only one sector where we would feel it. That's electronics and manufacturing. And there is no way around that, especially when it comes to things like computing and assembly. Now, pros and cons. Pros. China is not very high value add. There's nothing that China makes that can't be made somewhere else with a more sustainable supply chain at a lower price point. We've learned that because of COVID. Cons, the sunk cost of the industrial plant in China is immense. And it would take the United States at least five years to rebuild those supply chains in the Western hemisphere, noticeably in NAFTA. And that would hurt. There's no way around that. That said, after five years of reindustrialization, North America would have experienced five years of the fastest growth in its history. And at the end of the day, would have supply chains that are shorter, simpler, that employ locals, that sell to locals, that are cleaner, that use the most advanced technology that's available of the day, and are largely immune to international shocks. It's a transition we have to go through one way or another because the Chinese demographic picture is utterly unsustainable. It is a death pact. A war would speed that up, obviously. So I would argue that the North Americans need to do this regardless. And the sooner they get started and the faster they go, the less painful it will be. Putin's made a lot of fanfare about their relationship and how close they are. And then every now and then you seem to see some news coming out of China that Xi's not very happy with Putin and he wants to see, you know, a plan for how the war is going to end. And so what do you make of that relationship and, and where do you see that going? Oh, the, the, Xi is pissed. There's no doubt about that. When they did the whole no holds barred friendship, the Chinese assumed that this was going to be a quick war. But one of the fun things about when you plan to say, like, take over Taiwan is you make certain assumptions about how things are going to go. And the Chinese have been making certain assumptions for 45 years, and the Russians have now proved all of them wrong. So for one, the Chinese thought this would be a fast war. And they looked forward to the Ukraine war being a template for Taiwan. And here we are dragged on a year later, and Russia's not doing great. And they always knew that the Taiwan war would be tougher than Ukraine, because you can walk to Kiev. And the Ukrainians have only been preparing for eight years. You got to swim to Taipei and the Taiwanese have been preparing for 45. So, you know, assumption one, gone. Assumption two, Russian weapons are great. So let's steal the IP and clone them and outfit our equipment. They spent 30 years and 3 trillion U.S. doing that. 
and now they're having some very serious buyer's remorse. Assumption number three, Russia is too important. No one will sanction it. Well, that one out the window. And say what you will about the Russian economy. It's corrupt, it's inefficient, but wow, is it a massive producer of energy and foodstuffs. China's the world's largest importer of both. Hell, they import 80% of the inputs that allow them to grow their own food. You take the sanctions that are on Russia, you put them on China, you get a deindustrialization collapse complete with a famine that kills a half a billion people within a year. So every assumption the Chinese have made, Putin has proven wrong. And the Chinese are not happy about that because it now means they have to start completely over. But now they're in a one man dictatorship and there's no one left to come up with a plan B. Let me talk about the Ukraine war a little bit, just so the stage is set, and then we'll move sure. on to Canada. So what you're looking right here is the Russian space. Uh, north is to your right. The map on the right is a population density map, and that lighter color of orange is roughly the population density of the southern third of Manitoba if you remove Winnipeg. So yes, you've got neighbors. Yes, you know their names. You've probably lost track of their lives. If you go to the left, the green zone, that is the Russian wheat belt. Of the world's major agricultural zones, it's the least productive agricultural zone in the world of the major ones. In the winter, it's about like northeastern Alberta, so cold, dry, windy. And in the summer, it's like western Kansas, hot and dry. If you go to the right, the blue is tundra and tegai. Go to the left, the yellow is desert. The out Output, agricultural output from the green zone is so poor, so low, that the Russians have never been able to generate enough economic activity in order to build a road network. So if you're going to move anything in the Russian space, rail is your only option. But what really drives the Russians to drink is the beige on the shoulders, territories that are completely flat but are economically useless even by Russian standards. And you can totally shove a Mongol horde through that. So the Russian strategy is to expand out of the green through the beige and block up the geography. Get to these areas where you can't run a panzer division through them because they're too rugged. And then forward position those rail supplied, slow moving troops in the access points between. Putin's been working on this for 23 years. There have been seven conflicts in the former Soviet space since then. They have all been about rebuilding the old Soviet position in these access arcs with the hopes of plugging them so that foes cannot invade. Russia has been invaded 50 odd times in their history. And every time the foe has made it to the wheat belt, the green zone, they've never pushed them out. It's been the weather that's done it. The only time that Russia has ever been secure was during the Soviet period, because then the access points were blocked. Now, I realize there's no one in Europe that's looking to invade Russia right now, but the Russian demographics are as terminal as the Chinese demographics, and they know if they don't act now, they will never be able to act again. They see this as an existential, as an existential struggle for their own survival, and they're right. But to give them what they want, you have to subjugate over 100 million other people, and that's never been in the cards. There are any number of economic after effects from this, but the one that's going to be mattering the most to North America is what's going to go down in Germany. We're looking at a pipeline map here. The red lines, those are the natural gas pipelines, and this is the one that matters the most. This is Nord Stream. It provides direct access from the Russian natural gas fields under the Baltic Sea to Germany. And when it was shut off last September 1, it was 40% of Germany's total intake. And then later in September, somebody blew it up and it's never coming back. Now, 40% of the total means that this is not a marginal supplier. And if you only have a marginal disruption to your energy input system, things get really bad really quick because energy demand is inelastic. If you need a liter of gas to get to work and you can only get nine tenths of a liter, you will pay whatever you have to to get that last tenth. But then what you pay for that last tenth determines the entire price for the entire market. So in losing 40% of their total, 
the Germans are now struggling with natural gas prices that are seven times what they were before the war. And even if they replace all of the volumes with other suppliers, those suppliers will be marginal and they will be more expensive and riskier and it won't affect the price because the main stuff is offline. And the Germans don't use energy like we do in North America. I mean, we, in the United States, we talk a good game when it comes to energy paranoia about independence, but we really don't care. So we take energy from Mexico and from Canada and from Saudi Arabia. And if no one's looking, we'll take some from Venezuela on the side. Can't do that in Germany. Precision manufacturing needs reliability. So the Germans rely on long-term deals with fixed infrastructure supplied by state companies that they think are more reliable. Well, that whole thing is broken down now. And then they use that natural gas, not just to generate electricity, but it forms the basis of their petrochemical sector. And for the most part, those petrochemicals products are not exported. They're kept in-house and they form the basis of the manufacturing sector. It's all gone. The Germans are having a good month right now because it's atypically warm. Unless that is the future for every winter, this is only temporary. We're, we're looking at a breakdown of the entire German manufacturing sector. BASF, that's their big chemicals company, is literally physically dismantling their industrial plant across Germany and shipping it to other locations, most notably Louisiana and the United States, in the hope that they can reassemble it, tap U.S. shale gas, and ship the end product back to Germany to save their country. But that's going to require a build out in Louisiana that is faster than what the Nazis did in Germany in World War II. More likely, this is just the end of the German economic model. And the German system is heavily integrated into Denmark and Austria and the Netherlands and Belgium and Poland and the Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary. So we are looking at the end of Central Europe as a modern industrialized system in less than two years. So Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is making his first official, official visit to Canada next week. And there's speculation that he's looking to Canada to provide them with liquefied natural gas. German Chancellor Scholz visited Canada in August seeking liquefied natural gas as well. But the response that he got from Ottawa was don't count on it. And I think in that case, the Liberal government had questioned whether those terminals could be profitable or built fast enough to make a difference to Europe's long-term supply difficulties. So uh, all of this was before Nord Stream was blown up in yeah. September. So I, I got to ask, what do you think? I mean, obviously that's got to change the equation. Should Canada be in the business of exporting liquefied natural gas? I try not to use the word should because everybody is going to come at this from a different point of view. I can sure. tell you that the business case has improved drastically because we're the Russians are one of the world's major exporters of LNG, both from the, the the north, excuse me, from their northern coast in the Arctic, as well as from the Sockland projects. And those are all going to go down for lack of foreign partners and tech. So you take that offline and the business case improves. The desperateness of the Germans in specific and the Europeans in general, the business case improves. And if we have a follow on dust up in a place like the Persian Gulf, then we're looking at Qatari natural gas potentially falling off on falling offline as well. So that would suggest, again, that the business case will improve. But you know Canadian internal politics better than I do. If you want to bring the natural gas from Alberta, and let's be honest, that's where almost all of it is. If you go east, that's a lot of provinces that can say no for whatever reason that they want. And if, even if everyone says yes on day one, you still then have to build the liquefaction facility in the pipeline, and that's a multi-year project. That's not going to be soon enough to help the Germans. Now, if you go west through BC, that wouldn't take nearly as much time. And that, because the Japanese are not facing a acute crunch, they've got a little bit more time that they could, in theory get by without it. One thing about the Germans is they have systematically shut down one part of their energy system after another. And so they're now completely dependent on lignite and natural gas from Russia. Now they've lost the natural gas. So Germany is now one of the most carbon dirty countries on the planet. Japan's different. They don't have a unified grid. Every city has an LNG import facility, a coal burning facility, what little green tech they can get and they have some title stuff 
and they have LNG import facilities. So each one is used to shuffling things around. And if you can throw LNG into that mix, they will all do better, but it's not as critical as it is for the Germans, but mostly the Japanese have more time. A lot of the opposition to LNG export pipelines in general comes from the environmental risks, the environmental concerns. How, how do you think about the differences between the environmental risks of LNG versus oil? Well, natural gas, if you're going to burn it for power, as a rule, generates roughly half of the carbon that a coal plant will. So in terms of net increase, if you just look at the German case where they're burning lignite, it's a lot more than that. So, you know, that that's a gain. What's the best way I can say this without deliberately pissing everyone off? The environmental push to get rid of all fossil fuels in most places is actually increasing our carbon footprint. If you're in a place like Germany that doesn't have good wooden potential outside of the North Sea and no good solar potential anywhere, putting up solar panels actually increases the amount of carbon that you're putting into the system because they're never going to generate enough power to pay it back down. In addition, Germany only gets sun for a few weeks of the year in the summer when everyone's on vacation. So when you're actually doing the hard work of living and working, you're going to be running off of something that has to run either at night, which is peak demand in Germany, or in a time when the sun's not shining very bright because it's the winter. So you're never going to get rid of the fossil fuel and the nuclear-based system. And if you build another system on top of it that doesn't work very well, you're just putting more carbon into the system. Now, that story is different in every part of the planet. If you're in a sunny location like, say, Southern California, by all means, for God's sakes, do solar. If you're in the Great Plains or the Prairie Provinces, do wind. It's brilliant. But you've got to match the technologies to where you are. And one of the advantages of liquefied natural gas is it's the lowest carbon fossil fuel and it's portable in concentrated form. And for most parts of the world, that is actually the greenest fuel source, source that you're going to be able to hope to get. That's super interesting. So back in August, when the Germans came to Canada asking for LNG, our natural resources minister told routers that the government now thought the best solution was to export hydrogen, not LNG, specifically because the world is moving away from fossil fuels, as he said. And I'm curious, what do you think of the logic of that? What do you think of hydrogen as a, as a fuel source of the future? Hydrogen is new. So it's difficult to project what it's going to look like in 10, 20, and 30 years, both from a cost and a carbon point of view. But what we know right now, with the technology we have now, it is the dirtiest fuel source on the planet. Making hydrogen using something other than natural gas as the feedstock means you're using carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water. And those three molecules are the most stable molecules that we are aware of on this planet. So the amount of energy that it takes to break them into something else in order to form methanol and then get hydrogen is the most exothermic reaction that you can do at scale. So anyone who's doing hydrogen with today's technology is actually just setting up a massive carbon bomb. Now, the theory is if we build out more and more and more wind and solar in places that are both windy and sunny, then the energy is free and it doesn't matter how much energy it takes in order to generate those reactions. But there is no place on the planet right now where that exists. And there is no place in Europe at all that has the wind or the solar potential in order to do this at scale, except for maybe Scotland. And now we're wrapped up in Brexit and the Scottish independence movement. It's just there just aren't many places where this works as we understand the technology now. Now you change the technology and 20 years from now it will obviously look different. I will reserve the right to change my mind. But right now that would actually make our carbon problems far more intensive than they already are. So um, food production has come into conflict with Canada's greenhouse gas emission targets. Ottawa recently announced a plan for Canadian farmers to reduce nitrous oxide emissions to 30% below 2020 levels by 2030. The agricultural industry prefers targets that would reduce emissions on an intensity basis, and that would allow them to keep emissions the same, but just produce more food. What do you think of the government's current plan? Obviously, Canada is part of one of the major agricultural belts of the world, and, and Russia and Ukraine have, have complicated the other one. 
I know you consider yourself a green. What's, what's the right way to do this? There are three nutrients that allow us to grow plants. Potash, of which Canada is a world leader. At the moment, that is not triggering in the green community. Phosphate, for which North America as a unit is broadly self-sufficient. The greens are not upset about that. And nitrogen. Arguably, nitrogen is the most important of the three. And nitrogen is what some folks are trying to get rid of. You cannot maintain output levels without high levels of nitrogen fertilizer. Now, the day may come where we have a technology where we can do that in a way with fewer emissions and less runoff. That technology does not exist today. So if, if, if Canada does go down this path, it removes itself from being one of the world's massive agricultural exporters, and that will kill several hundred million people. That's a value, that's hmm. a value balance, green versus humanitarian life support pretty heavy. Yeah. Now, if every agricultural zone is dealing with some version of this question moving forward, because there's a lot of fertilizer disruption coming out of the former Soviet Union, and we all need to find ways to improve efficiencies and output. And using less fertilizer should not be on that list, in my opinion. So Canada has five problems that you have to take into account because all of them affect real estate. The first one is geographic and political. The population is stretched out, basically hugging the, the American border for warmth. And because of the way that Canada was formed as a co-dominium of Anglos in Ontario and Quebecois in Quebec, you have made the decision very early on in your process that the provinces have immense power vis-a-vis -vis the central government. That means you didn't get your first trade deal until about three years ago. When I say trade deal, not with another country, within Canada. So internal barriers to trade remain immense, and almost every province in the Canadian system, as this graphic shows, has a greater an economic relationship south with the United States than it does with their own co-nationals. And in that sort of environment, Canada is always going to be incredibly exposed to international trends, especially as involves the elephant next door. Now, you fast forward 10 years, you do away with provincial autonomy somehow, that changes. I don't think that's going to happen in 10 years. If, if we're not trading enough between provinces, what do you see as being the biggest opportunities for us to, to do more there? Hmm. You have become so used to exporting raw commodities to the wider world because the United States has most of what it needs already. And then just participating in American automotive because that's where the market is. If you really, really, really do want to have a cross Canadian system for trade, you're going to have to have a much more efficient East West transport system. But I'm not sure that that will work with NAFTA clauses because you have to allow North-South to work just as well as East-West under the clauses of the, of the new treaty. So anything that you do is going to be for integration has to be between large population centers. And the only two large population centers that Canada has in very close proximity that can get synergies are Montreal and Toronto. And so for you to solve that, you have to solve the core Canadian identity question over what it means to be Canadian. And it has to be the Anglos of Toronto and the Quebecois of Quebec who are answer that question the same way for this to work. That's a question you're very familiar with. And I think if you had an answer to it, you would have provided it already. Problem number two is strategic. This is a Cold War map. All the dots are where the Russians had their military bases. During the Cold War, Canada was in a privileged position. Now, the United States had created globalization in order to build an alliance to fight the Soviets. And whenever we tried to get a trade relationship with other countries, we always had to give in a little bit because we got full security control as a result. That, that was the, the guns for butter trade that defined the Cold War and American strategic policy. Now, Canada, because it's on the flight path for the missiles from the Soviet Union to the United States, could have been a security free rider. You could have been neutral. To your credit, you chose not to. In fact, to your credit, the Canadians were always the first ones for any fight. If they saw a crisis in the world, they'd pick up the phone, they'd call the president, and the first words the Canadian prime minister always said is, we see what's happening, we're here, how can we help? And that made Canada our fastest friend. But you weren't dumb about it. <laughs> 
the next words out of the Canadian's mouth, after all the security details were worked out, be like, we would really appreciate a little bit more market access for Quebecois cheese or Ontarian spark plugs or whatever it happened to be, softwood timber, if you will. On over 70 different occasions, Canada carved little melon scoop exemptions out of American trade law, and all of those were folded into NAFTA 1. And that's how things lasted until this guy came along. We've been moving away from the globalist approach in the United States for some time, but Donald Trump was the first one to make it the centerpiece of his foreign policy. And he loved Trudeau because Trudeau was perceived around the world as the only world leader that Donald Trump was smarter than. With that in his back pocket, Trump played hardball on trade negotiations and all of those exemptions that Canada had spent 40 years building into American trade law were jettisoned in the NAFTA II discussions. The only reason that there's even an adjudication function in there isn't because of Canada, it's because Nancy Pelosi put it in at the last second within the U.S. House. Now, as we all know, Justin Trudeau is not the brainchild that is running Canada. That would be Christina Freeland. And at the time that Trump was president, became president, she was your trade negotiator and ultimately your foreign minister. And she attempted to play the old playbook in the NAFTA negotiations, the idea that Canada has a special place in American trade law and it's justified in getting its exemptions. And I'm not saying this to denigrate her. I think she's one of the smartest people on the planet right now. But her first week on the job was Trump's first week on the job. And she was handed a playbook that became obsolete the day she took her office. And so she was pushing for things into NAFTA II that the United States had no interest in, on labor, on environmental regulations. And at the end of the day, the Americans got sick of it and cut a bilateral deal with the Mexicans to cut Canada out of NAFTA completely. And this is the photo from the stage when she found out. The Mexican and the American negotiators didn't tell her ahead of time. And after this meeting, she was simply told, the United States is going to proceed with this in eight days with the Mexicans. You have eight days to accept the original terms. If you don't, fine, you're on your own. Seven days later, Justin Trudeau signed, and we got NAFTA too. Problem number three, geography. What you're looking at here is not a population density map. It is a spatial expansion map. So cities that are in green or blue are not very physically constrained. They can expand in almost all directions. That keeps development costs low. Cities that are in red and orange have difficulty. Maybe they have an ocean or a mountain or a national park or some sort of protected wetlands or something. They can't physically expand very easily. And so their internal labor costs, excuse me, their internal land costs tend to be very high. That makes for lie expensive housing. We've got three trends that are going on in Anglo-America right now, same on both sides of the border. Number one, because of COVID, not a lot of people want to be reliant on public transport. Cities with a circle can't function without city transport, so people are moving out. Number two, the baby boomers on both sides of the border want to move somewhere warm. They don't want to shovel snow in February. They're moving south, or in the case of Canada, west. And then third, the millennials are coming of age, they're raising families, and they want to be in a place where they can have a backyard. They have to move to a place where land costs are lower. So we're seeing people moving out of the coastal cities, and that's on both sides of the border, into the interior, and specifically in the American South, Southwest, and West. You guys don't have a lot of room. I know that Canada is a freaking huge country, but if you start preferencing away from Vancouver and Montreal and Toronto, there aren't a lot of other options. And so you're seeing significant distortions across your entire labor structure. Fourth, demographics. Here's your provincial demographics as of a couple of years ago. You'll notice a couple things about Ontario, Quebec, and BC. You guys have, for the most part, stopped having kids a while ago. You are rapidly aging. Not into obsolescence. We're not there yet. 
But in this decade, that big bulge of people in their 50s will have moved into their 60s. And then the economic case for the three biggest Canadian provinces gets very, very difficult because you're going to have to tax your young people in order to support your retirees. And if the taxes get too high and the services get too low for the young people, they will relocate. Alberta to this point has been a bit of an exception because of the oil boom. It has drawn people in from the other provinces, especially people in their 20s and 30s who are still going to have kids. And that makes Alberta your youngest demographic structure in the entire country. But the housing stock that you have in the rest of the country is not necessarily appropriate for the way your demographic structure is evolving, except again, possibly in Alberta. And that mismatch in an environment of capital shortages, in an environment when we need to double the size of the industrial plant, means that there's a contest for every single dollar that is available for investment. Do you put it into industrial plant? Do you put it into infrastructure? Do you put it into training? Do you put it into housing? You're gonna have to choose. So what is it about Alberta that makes it its housing stock set up the best for its demographics and for immigration? Sure. The, the tar sands boom really got going about 15 years ago. And in the first year, you the, 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 the Albertans were attracting people from all over Canada with a heavy emphasis, of course, on the Maritimes because the economic dislocations there have been pretty rough. But most of the people who were coming were in their 20s. And that meant they were mostly men. And within a couple of years, it became apparent that Calgary really needed to recruit a wider array of people in order so that these people were not doing what happens in the United States and just living in man camps. And so the decision was made early on to put a lot of effort into building larger apartments and multifamily or sorry, single family homes so that these young men who were coming in could actually have a reason to bring someone with them, maybe bring kids with them. And then the expansion of the economy within Calgary itself attracted a lot of women from all parts of Canada in order to do the non-oil jobs. And all of a sudden, you've got people from BC and people from Nova Scotia falling in love in Calgary and buying a single family home. And it's the one place in Canada where most of the housing construction was not catering to foreigners. So it wasn't just condos. It was actually people who wanted yards. And that made for a very, very different property market in Alberta compared to everywhere else. Now, to this point, Canada has always had a trump card, immigration. As long as you are bringing in people in their 20s and their 30s and their early 40s, people have already finished their primary and secondary education somewhere else, so you don't have to pay for it. But then they come in and they work for 30 or 40 years before they retire, you have been able to function on a bit of a treadmill. The people who come in, as long as they're young enough, have enough time to pay into the system to then pay for their own retirement. But if they don't come in until they're in their 40s, they will never pay in enough to justify the budgetary expense that it takes. Until recently, this has just barely held up. But what has happened under COVID is the input pipeline has stopped. In addition, the nature of immigration that you've attracted in the last years has been dramatically different from what's come before. It's no longer people who are coming to work and live forever. It's people who come and drop some money, maybe establish residency, but don't actually work and then move on. And they use their financial assets to buy physical assets in Canada, primarily real estate, that they then do not live in. And because they're either fleeing the European financial crisis or the Chinese breakdown, they're relatively cost insensitive when they're evaluating property. Because from their point of view, if 10, 15 years from now, the property is only worth half what they paid for it, for them that's still a win because it means they got half their money out of a dying system. That has been your primary investment portfolio for the last few years. And that means that most economic activity in some of your provinces has been real estate based upwards of 30, 40% in BC specifically. And a lot of the Canadian provinces are getting three, 4% of their tax intake from nothing more than transferring titles from one real estate owner to another. That treadmill is now breaking down. Two things, number one, the world is opening up a little bit more 
And so there's a different class of people that's looking to leave as these other systems really approach the brink. They're older, they have more money. So all the distorting things that we've been talking about here are going to get worse. And second, because so many foreigners have bought so much property in so many gateway cities in Canada, a lot of Canadians cannot afford to live in their own country anymore. That has a political impact. And so the Trudeau government, effective January 1, has put restrictions on the ability of foreigners to own real estate. So how will this all shake out? Way too soon to tell. The ban's only been in place for a week and a half. And it's going to change the nature of who's coming to Canada. And we're already feeling that pressure south of the border as some of it diverts. As a rule, all else being equal, most foreigners would rather be in Canada than the United States. It's considered more politically friendly. Or it was until January 1. And now the economic issue really, really, really matters. Deal with the last factor, the fifth one. What we're looking at here is American data again. The gray and the yellow is the same as that first slide. So that's net worth by decade. And that's everyone, that's average. The blue and the orange is median. So it removes the top and the bottom 1%. In the United States, half of all financial assets are held by the top 1%. And that means that in the United States, yes, we have a massive inequality issue. We're not going to solve that on a, on, a, on a podcast. But it also means that when you retire, if you're in the top 1%, you don't have to liquidate your entire portfolio. You probably only liquidate a third or a half of it. And that leaves a significant amount of capital engaged. The challenge that Canada is going to face is it has a more traditional wealth distribution. So domestic capital is dropping significantly and will stay low for a very long time. That means imported capital is what's going to be driving it. The United States is going to be the source for most of that simply because of this disparity within our own economic equality on the south side of the border. And then third, you're going to have a lot of desperate, desperate, hungry, scared money from the wider world looking for a way to land in Canada in an environment of a real estate block. A lot of moving pieces that are going to require both the provinces and Ottawa to come up with different policies. What Trudeau has done on the first, it makes sense to me whether or not it's gonna work, I do not know, but I know it's kind of only the opening gambit for the changes in policy that we should expect to see over the next several years. And if you play it wrong, the treadmill that keeps Canada functioning stops. And that, among other things, might mean that Canada is not able to participate in the reindustrialization of North America. Because if Canada can't draw those people in, it no longer has the workforce that is necessary to do the reindustrialization in the first place. So there's a lot of things that get tangled up here that Canada is going to have to assign values to and then muddle its way forward as we enter the most dynamic period in North American history since the War of 1812. So, I mean, capital is always scarce, but it's a, it's going to be a, a period of increased scarcity of capital. What scarce? We've been at zero well, interest <laughs> rates globally for a decade, and foreigners have been throwing money at Canada for that entire period. Real capital costs have been negative for years. We're now just returning to a more normal system, but then the baby boomers are gone. And then we go into a very tightly constrained system. So the capital flight coming to Canada, that is still going to be a very big piece of your solution. You just need to be able to, to divert it in a way that doesn't destroy the Canada that you know. If, if, if you can find a way to build financial products in Canada that allow all of this foreign flight to go into something other than real estate, that would be a win-win for everyone. Remember, the Federal Reserve is going to have to figure out a way to finance all of the green transition and all of the industrialization. If you can get foreigners to do that in Canada, go for it, especially if you can keep them out of real estate. So in a recent newsletter from uh, MortgageLogic.News, Rob McClister wrote that no one alive has witnessed a rate move like we saw in 2022, at least on a percentage basis. The next closest move was in uh, 1978 when rates in Canada doubled from 8 to about 16%. But there was also much less debt in the economy back then. So what's different this time? I'm going to toot my own horn for a little bit. I've always been a little bit of a Fed whisperer because the Fed, for the most part, 
ignores the financial world completely when it's making policy. It's more concerned with Main Street rather than Wall Street. I don't feel like I've got to get enough grip on the Bank of Canada to know exactly what they're going to do. But let me give you an idea of what I think the Fed is thinking. Interest rates and monetary policy as a rule are designed to regulate consumption. By raising and lowering the cost of credit, consumption rises and falls. That's always been the issue. Whether or not it's an appropriate tool for any given moment is irrelevant. That's the tool they have to use. And when the Federal Reserve looks at the demographic structure of the United States, it broadly likes what it sees because the millennials are a large generation that are now buying homes in mass and raising children in mass. And that means our system over the decades to come is very sustainable and the tools that they have are still going to be appropriate because we're going to have a lot of young people. Young people have the demand. The demand is what they regulate. And so when the Federal Reserve looks at the situation around the world, they really don't like what they see. Most countries are more like Canada, where there just isn't a replacement generation without immigration. And most countries are not Canada and so cannot handle the immigration. Most countries are more like Germany or Italy or China. And we are looking at the end of what we consider normal economics because there are no longer going to be enough young people in the world to carry things forward, whether it's childbirth, tax payments, or economic growth in general. So the Federal Reserve is not primarily looking at today's economic fundamentals in making these decisions with interest rates. I'm not suggesting they're ignoring them. Obviously, inflation is part of the conversation, but they are far more concerned about what happens after the next expansion. Because if you fast forward just five years, interest rates won't work in most places. They won't work in Germany or China or Japan or Korea or Taiwan or Thailand at all because there's no more demand to regulate. And in Canada, it will only work if Trudeau gets his way and you're able to import three to 500,000 new Canadians every year for the next five years in order to generate the population that will then generate the demand. They're trying to prepare enough dry powder so that the next time they need to lower interest rates, they have enough dry powder to do it and make a difference because they will be trying to shift the entire world off of the consumption of just one country. And so I don't think they're going to stop until they get to at least six because that's kind of the minimum that they've kind of penciled in as to what would allow them to get through the next crisis, not this one. There's a popular saying, I'm sure you've heard it before, don't fight the Fed. You know, what, what's the incentive of government that. going to be? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the incentive of the government going to be over the next decade and, and the decade after that? The, the biggest challenge the Fed is going to face is it, we were going to, as the Chinese and the German systems fail, we need to double the size of industrial plant in the United States in an environment where baby boomer capital is going to be increasingly unavailable. So the credit costs that is necessary when Gen X is the one providing the credit it, are going to be huge. And so the Federal Reserve has to take steps within policy. I don't know if it's going to be interest rate policy, but within policy to loosen up credit to make that to be an easier process because the alternative is inflation that's north of 10% for several years. I'm not sure there is a magical policy set that will let that happen but maybe some version of quantitative easing might. I don't know. We're, we're, we're not just getting out of my skill set here. We're getting out of traditional monetary policy tools because we are entering a fundamentally new era. So paying for that, financing that, at the same time we say we want to do the green transition, and all of that has to be front-loaded as well because the 80% of the cost for wind and solar is installation. The fuel is free costs just as much over the lifetime as fossil fuels, but it's all front loaded. That all has to be financed. And then of course, paying for the baby boomers retirement because the baby boomers certainly didn't save enough to do it. So those, those are our three big expenses. The last one is lost money. The second one is a political question. The first one is what fuels the United States for the next 60 years. So all else being equal, I know where the Fed would prefer to put their effort, but the Fed's only one part of our economic management system. Congress gets a say in this, and Congress is the one who decides what happens to Social Security and our pension system and our health care system. And none of that is cheap.
you know, even even though you're talking about the Fed, I think a lot of the major Western countries, central banks all move together. So um, well, they're not. That's the thing. Not anymore. One of the things we've seen in this tightening cycle is, yes, other countries have tightened, but only by like an order of magnitude less. The Europeans have barely moved. The Japanese have only moved on paper. Just if you don't have a demographic structure where your interest rates shifts can actually affect consumption, then there's no point in changing them. So you're probably going to see a little bit of movement in places like Sweden that have a better demography than the rest, but there are only other two other countries in the world that have a decent demography in the advanced world. That's New Zealand, where we're seeing interest rate moves, and France, which is part of the euro, so we're not. Okay. Well, so in summary, what should Canadian mortgage lenders, brokers, and developers be mindful of as they plan their businesses for the next five years? Well, let's start with the really trite thing. There is no Canada. There's a British Columbia. There's an Alberta. There's an Ontario. There's a Quebec. And they all have radically different property markets and radically different population structures. And that needs to be taken into account first and foremost in everything that you do. Second, to the degree that there is Canada, it's an immigration story. And that's a political question. You know, you know, you have to massively increase immigration in the aftermath of the COVID drop simply in order to hold still. If you want to participate in the North American industrial story, you need even more. And you've got to find a way to thread that needle between the newcomers who want property and the people who are already here who can no longer afford it. How you manage that politically, I would argue, is the single biggest crisis that Canada faces for the remainder of this decade. Yeah. Well, okay, let's talk about labor for a second. So I've heard you mentioned Canadian labor could be thought of as a competitor to U.S. labor, whereas Mexican labor is more complementary. Could you expand on your thinking there? And, and, and how, how does Canada fit into the mix? It's a cost and a labor structure issue. So Mexico isn't unskilled. They haven't been unskilled for 20 years. They're semi-skilled. They're good at moving around pieces of metal. They're good at anything that requires eyes and hands that can't necessarily be automated, but they're even good at some types of automation. Canada and the United States are both at the good at the high end. We both do design. We both do high-end assembly systems. We both do intellectual work. We both do high-end wiring. And so there's always this built-in tension between the United States and Canada. The way it's worked to this point is each Canadian province has integrated more south and they have laterally. So for all intents and purposes in manufacturing, Ontario and Quebec and BC are American states in terms of manufacturing and you're part of the milieu. But as Canada has aged demographically and the United States has not, or at least not as much, you're not going up the value added scale anymore, but your labor is becoming more expensive. And perhaps some regulations are on top of that complicating the issue. And that makes it very difficult for Canada to compete with the United States. Now, if Canada was on the other side of Mexico, you could benefit from Mexico in the same way that we can, but you're not. You're forced to try to integrate south. And in the case of Ontario, your, your best partner is Michigan and Ohio. Automotive, that works really well. But in the case of Quebec, it's aerospace. And the United States has some very pathologically formed opinions on aerospace. And one of the things we're going to see in the next couple of years is Airbus is going to go away. They get their aluminum from Russia. They get their titanium from Russia. And they get their engines and their wings from Britain. And Britain is applying for a free trade agreement with the United States. And we've made it very clear that one of the conditions is you join the, Bo the Boeing family instead of the Airbus family. And so all of a sudden, Bombardier has to make some very, very hard decisions about their future. A lot of this is wrapped up in what Donald Trump did in NAFTA too. It has foreseen a series of uncomfortable decisions on Canadian business about how to operate in an environment where the global structures are no longer there and it really needs to focus on the United States and Mexico. As almost any country in the world will tell you, the most uncomfortable place is to be number one or number two on the United States' worry list. Until now, Canada has been like number 20 or number 25, and that's allowed Canada to ignore and avoid a lot of the scrutiny that comes in from when the Americans feel paranoid about something. We're not in that world anymore. As American interests shrink back to North America, 
all of a sudden Canada is going to consistently make the top five list. That's not a great place to be. What are the opportunities that you see for Canada? And I guess more, more broadly, what does the future of the North American trade bloc look like to you? Well, let's start with the punchline. North America is going to be the fastest growing economic block of size in the world for at least the next 30 years. And Mexico specifically is going to be one of the top two growth stories for that same time frame. So from, from my point of view, the hard work for the three countries has already been done. The intellectual infrastructure is in place. The trade deal has been ratified and implemented. We've already tested the adjudication mechanisms. They work. I feel very good about the long-term prognosis. The challenge is going to be that doubling of the industrial plant in the next five years as Germany and China go away. Mexico has already hit the ground running, and as of the Three Amigos Summit, which just concluded today, all three countries are trying to figure out how they can move more and more of the semiconductors and electronic supply chain into North America, which is great. The problem for Canada is it's not clear that they can directly benefit from a lot of that. Canada does not have the green space or the population density or the availability of labor in its major cities to do a semiconductor build out. And a successful electronics manufacturing sector requires different skill sets at different price points. And Mexico is perfect for the United States for that because we've got the high skilled labor right on the border with their mid skilled labor. They can interact very, very easily. Canada is also high skilled labor at the same price point. So the Mexican labor system in this sector is very complementary to U.S. labor. The Canadian system would be competitive. And the only way that Canada could exist in that space, if they do the high value added stuff and ferry the intermediate products to Mexico via air, there are sectors where that model works, cell phones, for example. But for run of the mill semiconductors, no. And Canada does not have a domestic semiconductor skill set that is up high. So the sort of sectors that we face the biggest vulnerability in as a continent, electronics, computing, cellular. That takes a lot of skilled labor. And Canada has a shortage of labor. So for, again, for Canada to pull this out of the fire, they need those half a million people a year. And they have to have a place to be here and they need homes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you already have a better social welfare system. You already have a better healthcare system. The United States does not that that's a high bar, but it does make it easier to integrate people from different backgrounds. You need to do more of that in more parts of the country as quickly as possible. And that means encouraging people to live somewhere other than just the gateway cities. So you can make this as broad based and sustainable as you possibly can. And if you can pull that off, Canada will be an inseparable part of the North American experience, and it will enjoy years of the fastest economic growth in its entire history. And so will Mexico. And so will the United States. Ultimately, this is a really good story, but we're all going to have to do some uncomfortable things in order to get there. So what about the smaller cities and, and should we be trying to attract people to our smaller towns? You, you need them everywhere. And I understand the difficulty of attracting people to something that's not a gateway city. But when I look at the economic potential of Canada, the manufacturing possibilities for Quebec and Ontario, we've already kind of dealt with. I think there's a very strong case there, but of course people are going to be moving to the city. But Canada is renowned for exporting unprocessed commodities, whether it's mining or agriculture. If all you did is do a little bit of processing and some value added in your secondary cities, particularly in the prairies, you know, the jobs that would come for up from that would be beyond lucrative and should be should prove sufficient to draw people from international. If you're looking for an example in the States, look at the state of Iowa. It's not the most exciting place to live, but it's really the only American state that has kind of invested in going up the value added chain, not just from plant agriculture to animal agriculture, but the processing in order to do the soy crushing and make the oils and make the flour, whatever it happens to be, to send out a value added product instead of just the raw commodity. Okay, last question for you. Some of tech's biggest promises are pretty bold. For instance, robotics could possibly change the way geography matters with respect to manufacturing and labor. And 
artificial intelligence in particular. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but my Christmas break was was dominated by everybody playing with Chat GPT. I don't know. Have you had a chance to play with Chat GPT? I have, yes. <laughs> I mean, what it's 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 uh, it's quite fascinating. What do you make of it all? Where do you see artificial intelligence, robotics, perhaps three D printing? How, how do you see that all impacting your thesis and? And, and this coming decades. I expect that the rate of technological progress to slow considerably for the next 20 years. In order to do tech of any type, you need a lot of people in their 20s and their 30s who are highly interconnected in order to synergize. And you need a lot of capital to pay for the workers, to build out the systems in their prototype form, and then to apply it in mass, and everyone forgets this step, to keep updating the systems that are already in place as the technology improves. That takes more than everything else put together. We're not in that world anymore. The world's been aging out. We're running out of 20 and 30 somethings and we're running out of capital because of the retiring boomers. So the pace is always going to slow. We're seeing that with the Silicon Valley layoffs right now. And then second, even if you can solve the production side of the equation with automation, robots don't buy stuff. Trade requires consumption. So you have to have both. And automation can only help with the first piece of that. So in places where the capital structure is good and you still have a large number of young people and you have a lot of consumption, their tech is going to continue. It's going to be part of the solution. It's going to continue to move forward if at a slower pace. Outside of that zone, you should expect a significant regression. So that suggests, again, North America looks really good, especially if Canada can keep importing some of that top-notch talent. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. If people would like to learn more about you and follow you, where can they find you? Sure. The website is zion.com. That's Z-E-I-H-A-N. And if you go to zion.com slash newsletter, you can sign up for the video logs. They're free. They will always be free. And I will never share your data with anyone. 